from the John Inner Center. From John Inner Center in UK, she's a group leader there. And Yi Liang's work, she's one of the first people to um, develop high throughput RNA structure probing inside cells. I think that was one of the first few papers that came out, um, I think, in Nature. And then, so I've known Yi Liang's work for a really long time, and it's my pleasure to invite her to give a talk in GIS. So please. Yila, take Thank away. You. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, so it's it's very honored to actually uh, give a, a talk about our research, and uh, I needed to say Yue is the first one to develop uh, the INA structure high throughput method in the whole system. I think it's uh, 2010 from her study is the pretty much the first one. So thank you for the introduction, Yue. So um, I actually today gonna talk about uh, the past uh, seven to eight years, how my group uh, has tried to understand the RNA structure functionality in the plant system. So if you're looking towards uh, the, the central dogma, you can always see very complicated DNA structure, also very complicated uh, protein structure. But all the textbook, um, they draw the messenger RNA as a single line. It's like a messenger RNA don't have a really complicated structure. But I think uh, in the past several decades, people doing, you put any kind of RNA molecular into test tube, it can form kind of a secondary structure, which uh, a lot of people can see, no matter how long this RNA it is, it always can form a certain structure. Sometimes it actually can form very complicated structure like uh, RNA triplex, uh, pseudonote also g plaques. So why are in the, all our test, textbook, the message RNA still draw as a single line? The most reason is all these kind of a study uh, is actually in vitro. So we still don't know how the structure looks like in vivo and how these uh, uh, structure can function uh, in the biology content. So I think uh, as you mentioned about pretty much seven, eight years ago, there are several groups actually starting a, a new method called the in vivo RNA structure profile. So the methodology is based on chemical uh, um, probing. So these chemicals like a dimethyl sulfate can penetrate inside the cell and modify the single strand A and the C um, wasn Creek phase. So attach a method group on the wasn Creek phase. So what it can do is when you're doing the reverse transcription, it can stalling or uh, introduce the mutation at the site which the nucleotide can modify. So then you actually cooperate this uh, reverse transcription stalling with deep sequencing. You can actually capture the genome-wide uh, actually signature of a nucleotide modification um, profile. So uh, if you have a high chemical reactivity, so it means that you have a high probability to have a single stranded of this modified nucleotide. So if you have a low chemical reactivity, that means uh, you have a high probability this nucleotide will become double stranded. So there's another chemical called uh, uh, shape, so NAR, <clears throat> which also can uh, um, probe in the RNA structure information. So what it do is when it's single stranded, it can isolation the two prime hydroxyl group, and uh, similarly, it will actually block the reverse transcriptions uh, to actually carry on or introduce mutation on your site. I think uh, uh, in the past uh, seven, eight years, a lot of group tried to build up understanding of uh, RNA structure functionality using these kind of method. Uh, I think these uh, uh, US paper, I really enjoy these papers. So they actually <clears throat> show a lot of function onto virus, also human uh, RNA structure functionality. So today I gonna actually focus uh, on a couple of things we explore in the in context in the plant system. So we actually focus on three pretty much uh, major RNA biological process. One is RNA maturation. So for example, in the textbook, you can see uh, when the nascent RNA, pre-mRNA was actually uh, transcribed, it will draw as a single line. So although splicing is really complicated, but you can see this RNA is still like a single line. So whether or not a structure 
uh, inside the, the, the cell is still like a single line or it form into certain structure we don't know. So also RNA degradation, I got a demonstration the case in the microRNA mediated um, uh, RNA degradation pathway where the messenger RNA also draw as a single line when it actually interacted with the microRNA. So we also gonna explore what actually happening on these messenger RNA, whether or not it's actually have a certain structure. Similarly, another important biological uh, process is the translation. So when ribosome going through these RNAs, when or not these uh, messenger RNA still kind of uh, as remain single stranded completely or it form into a certain structure. So my group uh, is actually focused on plant system. So we majorly, uh, mainly using the Arabidopsis sidiana as what you can see a very beautiful plant as a model system. So recent years, we actually expand our understanding of RNA structure functionality in brassica, rice, also the wheat. So try to uh, um, understand broadly how the structure evolution it is. So today I'm gonna focus all these uh, interesting discovery we found in the Arabidopsis. So first the question is actually how the splice zone recognize the true splice site. So when the messenger a pre mRNA nascent RNA was transcribed through the uh, PAR2, you can actually see crossing the pre mRNA, you can always see a lot of actually nucleotide uh, sequence, GUAG signature crossing the RNA. But interestingly, some like, for example, the GU sequence can be recognized by splice. So the um, uh, splicing were happening on this site, but the other GU site is actually splice on won't be recognized to that. So we hypothesis whether or not the, these nascent pre mRNA contain certain structure feature which can actually help uh, the splice on to recognize uh, the axon intron junction site and uh, con undergoing the splicing process. So to do that, we needed to generate a, a, a RNA structure library before the splicing happening. So what do we do is we actually uh, modify our previous RNA structure method. So what do we do is we uh, chemical treated, a uh, shape chemical treated the plant, which actually all the single stranded uh, uh, site will be modified by the shape chemical. So after that, uh, we isolated the nucleus to enrich the proportion, which is a pre-mRNA before the splicing happening, okay? So then we enrich the nucleus to generate a deep sequencing, which capture the enriched pre-mRNA structure. So what do we actually do? Firstly, of course, you want to see how the metagene looks like. So what do we do is we separate the pre-mRNA into two proportion. One proportion is later in the mature mRNA, this pre-mRNA will be successfully spliced out. So we call spliced event. So also another group of pre-mRNA, which actually later in their mature mRNA, the splicing won't be successful. So you, we call it unsplice event. So when we pull out this two group of pre-mRNA structure, what we can find very struggling, only two feature we can capture is actually two nucleotide single stranded before upstream of five splice site. And uh, also the branching point is single stranded. So when the two nucleotide single stranded upstream of a five splice site, this pre mRNA is tended to actually spliced out later in their mature form. So what uh, is that the time when this result come out, we kind of disappointed because uh, we're looking for very fancy difference on the structure, but in the end, we only can find that these very tiny kind of a small change on the structure uh, uh, difference. So then we want to see whether or not this two dinucleotide will influence alternative or five splice site selection. Uh, what we can actually see is if the major happening on this GU, uh, the minor happening here, the major one will actually still contain this dinucleotide single stranded upstream of five splice site. Also, if we actually take the group, which actually the major coming up later, you also can see this two nucleotide is associated with the major five splice site, not the minor. So then at the time we think, okay, this two nucleotide single stranded might be a, a structure feature, like what actually happening as a, the sequence feature like a GU. So how we actually validate it. 
So we take one example, which is uh, this candidate gene. You can see uh, the individual profile for that. So if you see the shape re reactivity profile, you have at least a minus one, minus two, two nucleotide single stranded upstream of the splice site across in this axon intron junction. So which means this two nucleotide tend to be single stranded. And if you put it into it as a transient acid to actually test the splicing event, you can see uh, if you take the whole thing into the cell, it will actually see the splice event happening. So when uh, we actually try to see how we can validate this two nuclear single strand, we actually insert uh, a sequence upstream of U1SN binding site. So the U1SN binding site is nine nucleotide crossing the axon intron uh, junction. So three nucleotide in the axon, six nucleotide in the intron. So we don't want to disrupt the, this sequence content. So rather than that, we actually put a, a stem just to try to block the base pairing. So completely of this uh, nine nucleotide. So once we block the whole base pairing, uh, um, forming the whole base pairing crossing this U1 SNRNA site, you can see the splicing event is blocked. So it actually become unspliced, okay? So because we cannot change in the sequence, we can change in the partner base pairs. So what are we changing is actually disrupted the nucleotide of the partner base pair here on the minus one and minus two position. So we're changing this base pair to GG and AA. So no matter what we change, we can rescue the splicing event. So that means once this two nucleotide become single stranded, the splicing will happen. So if we actually mutated the other position crossing the UNS and a binding site, even sometimes with three nucleotide mutation, you don't see the rescue of a splicing event. So then we actually have a kind of confidence this two nucleotide single stranded upstream of five splice site is can regulate the five splice site uh, um, splice site recognition. So now we can update a little bit on the understanding of uh, the RNA structure towards uh, how they regulate the splicing. So if there's a two nucleotide single stranded upstream of five splice site, it tended to be actually recognized by splice zone and undergoing the uh, splicing. If the, the two nucleotide is blocked forming base pairing, it's likely will not be recognized by the splice zone. So we kind of update a little bit our understanding on how the structure might actually have a function in the splicing. So now I actually uh, switch to the microRNA mediated RNA degradation, which we have been really interesting towards uh, how it uh, actually might involve the RNA structure. So um, different from the animal system, so the plant microRNA, uh, microRNA mediated RNA degradation involved the microRNA base pairing with the target site for 2021 nucleotide. So if once these 2021 nucleotide have a certain complementarity, it's supposed to be the microRNA target. But uh, through the target founder, based on the complementarity, even sometimes you have a perfect uh, complementarity, the microRNA still cannot uh, actually cleave the microRNA target. So it always have a pretty much over 70% of a false positive in the plant uh, prediction of a microRNA target. So then that time we hypothesis whether or not the, the messenger RNA, which the microRNA target have a certain structure can control their interaction with the, the microRNA. So what do we do is similarly, we modify our method, try to capture the mRNA structure before the cleavage happening. So we try to get these RNA structure on these non a degradation product. So what we do is uh, we using uh, Arabidopsis uh, seedling to chemical treat the plant once it will modify all the single stranded on the degraded of RNA also a non-degraded intact RNA. So then we uh, enrich the poly A um, side also the cap of production. So try to only capture the pre-cleaved mRNA, so the intact RNA structure, then generate the intact RNA structure to understand the, how it actually, the structure will regulation the microRNA cleavage event. So the first question we want to know is whether the microRNA target site is uh, spatially accessible, like available for the microRNA to target, or it's actually forming certain structure crossing the target site. Okay, 
So interestingly, we find is almost all the validated microRNA target site is actually forming certain structure. So it's not a completely like a 2021 nucleotide completely uh, spatially single stranded, which is kind of understandable because uh, there are a lot of endonuclease inside the cell. So if you open completely 2021 nucleotide, it's likely to be um, degraded unspecifically. So this is the first thing we find is a target site forming certain structure instead of a completely single stranded. So then because it actually forming structure, it will undergoing a kinetics uh, um, a reaction towards actually interaction with microRNA. So then we build up the energy landscape for the whole microRNA mediated cleavage process. So if a target site forming certain RNA structure, it will uh, it will overcome an uh, energy barrier, we call delta G open, to open the target site, which able to binding with the microRNA, forming RNA-RNA duplex. So once it form the RNA-RNA duplex, it will overcome another energy, which is a cutting catalytic uh, um, um, uh, energy barrier to actually cleave the RNA. So when we actually are going through this energy landscape, there will be actually two scenarios for this energy landscape. One scenario is the delta G open, how easy to open this structure of the target site to be single stranded, this, how this energy barrier will be the key energy barrier for the whole reaction. So once you overcome this energy barrier, the whole reaction will go on. So then when there's another scenario, which is uh, the delta G cutting, so the catalytic uh, energy, which um, how easy to cut this target. So that uh, delta G barrier uh, open energy is not uh, the key, but uh, the cutting energy is actually the key. So we then testing how actually which model is uh, the, the one which inside the plant. So what do we do is we took uh, pretty much six uh, 600 validated microRNA target site and calculated their cleavage efficiency. And we can find that is, uh, there's a um, significant anti-correlation between the delta G open energy barrier with the cleavage efficiency. But uh, on the other hand is uh, the um, cutting energy barrier is actually don't have a significant correlation with the cleavage efficiency. So we know that uh, um, the, this scenario will be actually likely happening inside of the plant, which actually the, the key is how easy to open the target site the structure. Then once it uh, binding to the microRNA, the energy will go on. So very interestingly, this result is uh, correlated to the Reaper and also Clipper argonal uh, protein um, uh, pull down result in the plant system, where once where actually the, the target site is actually once in the plant, you normally pull down only the microRNA instead of the messenger RNA target site. But in the animal system, when you do the argonal rip seek or clip seek, you can always have the messenger RNA because once it's binding, it doesn't mean actually it will cleave. So that is actually one thing about the target site structure. So then we interesting actually what happening towards the franking region's RNA structure. So again, we did a metagene analysis where we actually separated the group to the non-cleavage uh, uh, group, also the cleaved product. So then we pull out uh, this uh, microRNA target site because the target site had a different lens. So we aligned the five prime uh, site, also the three prime site, and uh, checking the franking region upstream of uh, the five franking region, also um, the three end of uh, franking region. Very interestingly is uh, we only find a two nuclear single stranded uh, feature significantly associated with uh, um, cleaved event. So if the messenger RNA downstream uh, uh, a downstream of target site had a two nuclear single stranded, this target site will easily to be uh, microRNA cleaved. But if we don't have uh, the, the two nuclear single stranded, then it's likely won't uh, going, undergoing the microRNA cleavage. So again, two nucleotide single stranded come up from our analysis. So then we further do some validation towards whether or not this two nucleotide single stranded is important.
So what we do is we construct a transient assay with a, a, a microRNA target site. Then after that, we put a stem loop. So which immediately with the stem loop, that means don't have a time region. So when we actually put a, the two AA mimic these target adjacent motif between the target site and the stem loop, you can see once we actually put it on, the cleavage happening. So this is measure the RNA abundance of the target site. So without this two nucleotide single stranded, the RNA don't have a cleavage. Once you have this two nucleotide single stranded, the, the cleavage happening. So you have a low abundance of a target messenger RNA. So the other example is we're using G-Cogiplex as a structure block. So between the target site and the G-Cogiplex, without this two nucleotide single stranded time uh, uh, motif, which we don't see a significant cleavage happening on this messenger RNA, once you have this two time, uh, two nucleotide single stranded time region, you actually immediately have the degradation event. So based on that, we know these two nucleotide single stranded is important for microRNA cleavage. So then the question comes through is uh, whether or not it's actually purely due to the, the, the structure instead of other protein involved into it. So then we conducted uh, the uh, in vitro RNA cleavage, uh, microRNA cleavage assay. So again, you can see is without uh, the two nucleotide single stranded downstream of the target site, you actually don't see any cleavage happening. Once you have this two nucleotide uh, um, single stranded between the uh, downstream of target site, you can immediately see the cleavage product coming up. So the, then the question is whether or not this uh, franking uh, RNA structure feature influence through the, the binding of uh, the argonal. So then we did a, a argonal um, cleavage um, mutated uh, uh, protein assay. So put on the argonal mutant, which don't have a cleavage activity. So just to measure their binding. So what you can see is when we put on the no temp, no single stranded uh, region, messenger RNA, you can see it's pretty much similar between with the TAM, without the TAM. So that means with the single strand, this two nuclear single strand only control the cleavage process, not the binding process. So now we go over to what we capture um, towards the uh, current uh, stage, what we understanding about the structure towards microRNA immediate RNA cleavage is firstly, the target site form certain structure. It needed to overcome a delta G open energy to be completely single stranded to form the duplex. Once it formed the duplex, if the franking region had a, a downstream of two nuclear single stranded, then the cleavage will actually carry on. If it's it, the disruption don't have that two nuclear single stranded, and we actually don't go in through the cleavage uh, status. So then you kind of are curious, okay, what, what is really this, this kind of a two nuclear really doing? So then my postdoc searched uh, almost all the similar endonucleus, which the other one is a Cas13. So if you review the, the two nuclear single strand at the time we found here is the target site the downstream two nucleotide. If you have two nucleotide, the cleavage will switch on. If this two nucleotide forming certain structure, it will be unclaved. The similar actual research in 2016 on the Cas13, if you can see the guard RNA here, which downstream of the, 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 the target site, the PFS domain, which actually is non-G domain. So if this nucleotide is G, it will actually don't go in through the cleavage. If it's non-G, give a certain accessibility, then you can see the CAU, it will actually go in through cleavage. Then you see the, the guard RNA here, which is actually C. So which means if CG forming base pairing, this nucleotide won't have a certain accessibility, which might actually can explain what we find on the argonal system. So maybe the target site downstream of structure is kind of really important for the cleavage activity. So then we actually understand that as a plant people, we really want to see, okay, how much really strong impact 
towards uh, this kind of uh, discovery of uh, these TAM, so the two nuclear the single strand downstream of target site. So we take a, a very famous red flower gene, which called uh, a battle two. So it is, uh, this is actually the messenger RNA, the structure of uh, a battle two, AP2. So what actually happening is this is microRNA target site, which for the microRNA 172 target. So the downstream had a two nucleotide a, a base forming a base pairing with the upstream sequence. So this messenger RNA cannot undergo the microRNA 172 target uh, a cleavage. So then we actually, because it's in the coding region different from the, the, the animal system. So we only can mutate the synonymous mutation here. Okay. So we changing this patterning base pairing A to to G, to U, to C. Once we changing this nuclear the disruptor, this base pairing, you see the cleavage actually happening. So which means for once you disrupt this time, you can actually get this non-cleavage uh, target become cleaved, okay? So because this AP2 is actually very important the flowering um, um, identity gene. So then we want to see how much power if we just changing structure of that. Okay, so here is the Columbia, so the normal white type of plant Arabidopsis. You can see beautiful white petal here. If in the AP2 non mutant, which you don't have the AP2 gene at all, so you can see the flower petal were lost. Okay, so then when you complement with the Y type, so all the sequence exactly gonna form the structure which block the microRNA 172 binding site, so non cleavage AP2, you can see the petal kind of coming back, like uh, if you complement this mutant. So this will actually look like a, more like a Y type. So then we complement the synonymous mutation AP2, which can open up the TAM, which causing the microRNA 172 switching on the microRNA cleavage pathway. So then what you can see, no matter it's changing to synonymous mutation A to G, A to U, A to C, this actually flower phenotype is remain as non-mutant. <clears throat> so then we know, okay, we can just changing one synonymous mutation changing, which actually changing the structure, which changing the, the, the microRNA cleavage fate. So based on that, we're pretty much confident uh, this is gonna be really interesting actually uh, application to actually changing the plant growth. So uh, just a, a little bit of summary onto that. So microRNA target site form certain structure. Downstream of uh, the target site will have a two nuclear single strand we call TAM, target adjacent motif. Once this target site is, uh, uh, the, this TAM region is single stranded, the cleavage will happen. If it forming certain base pair, it won't actually go through the cleavage. So now we have a little bit of update on the understanding of uh, microRNA mediated RNA degradation pathway. Then we actually focus on the translation pathway. So here I just uh, demonstration one specific uh, uh, kind of special RNA uh, structure motif called a G culture plaques. So what this G culture plaques is doing is if you check in the sequence where you have uh, four repeat of uh, G2 or G3 repeat on the sequence, it will capable to form these kind of a complicated uh, RNA tertiary structure, which called a G culture plaques. So what it is using is uh, it's not only using the Watson Crick phase, it's also using the Hugenstein phase to forming uh, the, the quartet. So the, the blue kind of a 4G uh, plate. So once you have a two layer or three layer kind of a plate, you can actually form these kind of a G culture plaques tertiary structure. And uh, potassium, which can actually use the to stabilize this structure when by stucking in the middle of these two um, touch uh, uh, plate, plate structure. And if you have lysium, which is very small, so it couldn't hold in here, so it can destabilize this structure. So we can using this uh, potassium and the lysium to switch the folding status of this G culture plaques. So in the past, a lot of in vitro assay, also antibody assay, try to capture the G-Cotroplex formation. So however, because first uh, in vitro cannot represent what is the status in vivo, also the uh, protein antibody tended to actually driven the equivalent towards actually folding status. So a lot of actually questions still remain towards whether or not the G-Cotroplex is actually existing inside the cell. 
So why G quadruplex is important is if G quadruplex in the five UTR or the three UTR, it actually can block the translation. So a lot of actually hypothesis is actually try to understanding how G quadruplex can regulate the translation process. So what do we do is again, we're using an AI shape agent uh, where it actually have a very unique uh, feature on the G quadruplex is when you fold uh, this kind of G-rich sequence in the potassium concentration in vitro, um, because of this kind of a tertiary structure exposed the two prime hydroxyl group of the last G of every G track towards uh, more outside. So the two prime hydroxyl group will be more uh, reactive with the NAR, which causing the uneven distribution of a modification pattern. So these Gs uh, tend to react with NAR more. So when you do the reverse transcription stalling, these G will actually have a more stalling than other G. So using this kind of uneven distribution of the reverse transcription pat uh, stalling pattern, we can know, okay, this G culture plaques is actually forming. So if you actually folded it in the lithium condition, which G quadruplex cannot be stably folded, so you lost this kind of uh, you, uh, special modification on the last G of G quadruplex. So you can see an even distribution of reverse transcription stalling. So based on that, so we can set up a, a folded status and unfolded status. Here is a one example which validated by biophysics assay. So we using that to set up a benchmarker. So again, in the lithium condition, this RNA folded, uh, uh, the G quadruplex cannot fold it. So you can see it's pretty much more even distribution of a mo uh, um, shape uh, modification. But if you fold it in the in vitro potassium level, you can see it's very skewed uh, kind of a, uh, pattern. So you can see uneven distribution, especially more modification on the last G of G, G quartet. So then very simple. Once we have the in vitro standard of the folded status and also in vitro standard of unfolded status, we just need to compare the in vivo status to the folded and unfolded to see whether or not the in vivo status had this G quadruplex is folded or not folded. So what we actually measure is if it's close to the in vitro folded status, then the folding score is one. If it's close to the unfolded status, the folding status will be zero. So then we can actually know, okay, whether or not this G quadruplex is formed. So again, if you see um, the previously in vitro actually profile, lithium, you see more even distribution, potassium, you see, very actually uneven distribution. Then you're looking for the in vivo, it's more similar to the potassium. So we know this G quadruplex on this messenger RNA is a folded in vivo, okay? So this is actually a study in uh, the, the, the plant system. So we want to know, okay, whether or not it affects the plant growth. So we have this messenger RNA, which we knock it out. So basically it don't have this RNA any longer. So the knockout mutant have a shorter plant root compared to the Y type of Columbia, where G quadruplex will form. So once we complement with the G quadruplex sequence, uh, you can see we can complement this whole phenotype uh, to the mutant to back to the Columbia Y type. Once we mutated uh, all these G quadruplex to G to A, which we abortion the capability forming G quadruplex, then you can see this root is longer than um, the, the normal Columbia. We are actually more like uh, you actually have a more level of this um, gene. So then it's very interesting is once you block the G quadruplex, you can have a longer plant root. So based on that, we want to know what this G quadruplex really affect the molecular function of that. As I said, when we check the, the messenger RNA level of both complementarity line, the messenger RNA level is pretty much, RNA level is very similar. When we did a polyzone associated uh, fraction, we found actually the mutated G quadruplex have a high translation uh, efficiency than the, the Y type uh, sequence. So which we know that uh, this G quadruplex can actually block the translation, which causing the effect on the plant root growth. So 
when we actually going through the global uh, transcriptal, we can find uh, several hundreds of uh, like a strongly folded G culture plaques. So if you can see the whole distribution of uh, genome wide uh, G culture plaque site, you can see a median of 0.75. So most actually close to the one status. That means globally, uh, these G culture plaques in the plant is existing. So interestingly, when we're actually looking for the rice, it has even high average folding kind of a, a score. You can see it's more shifted to stronger folded status. So in the rice, it's also globally exist uh, this G culture plaques uh, motif. So interestingly, the similar kind of DMS based uh, method from uh, David Battelle's group uh, in 2016, they found actually the mouse in the east, uh, these G culture plaques uh, is actually don't exist. They think it's unfolded inside of the cell, which kind of a surprise to us. But uh, now we actually go back is uh, most plant are growing pretty much 20, 20 degree. Instead of actually 28 degree, 30 degree, or 37 degree for the mouse, maybe um, it's more easily preferable to actually fold into relative, in the, under relatively low temperature. So based on that, we did a geo function of all the G culture plaques we found in vivo folded. Interestingly, we found almost all these kind of stress response uh, gene function from these kind of folded G culture plaques. Especially you can see it actually responds to code. So then my postdoc immediately actually did a, a code library. So basically we just put a plant into a code four degree for four, two hours, then perform the, the shape probing again. Try to compare the code profile with the in vitro folded status and in vitro unfolded status, similar like what we did for the 22 degree, okay? So then we found actually uh, globally, when we actually treat with a code on the rhabdopsis, sometimes you have uh, these kind of uh, 22 degree don't fold um, these G culture plaques. Now in the four degree at a starting fold. So if you can see this 22 degree kind of a mimic uh, the lithium condition unfolded status, the four degree actually more similar to the folded status in vitro in the potassium level. So which means for actually the folding state of G culture plaques uh, INA G culture plaques is actually enhanced globally uh, in response to the code. So how many actually shift it is? So this is a 22 degree when you see uh, a generally close to one kind of folding status of a, a global uh, G culture plaques measurement. So when you actually see the four degree, you can see a shift to much more stronger folding uh, of G culture plaques. So we know it's actually uh, really strongly enhanced the folding states even after two hours of a, a four degree treatment. Okay, so then we're using G culture plex antibody BG4 to confirm what we find. So again, if you see this is a control status 22 degree, you see some spot of uh, G culture plex, which BG4 can recognize these uh, green spot is actually where the potential G culture plex formation site, low, low site. So then you actually put a two, uh, two hours code, you can see it enhance these dot where actually the G culture plex uh, much more strong, uh, strongly trigger or induced uh, formation uh, under the tr code treatment. So when you return back to two hours, like a two hours return back to the uh, room temperature, so 22 degree, you can see this actually starting reduce the spot. So uh, the G culture plaques kind of unfolded. So this is giving you a control, which is a G culture plaques specific uh, ligand, which actually can heavily stronger induce uh, the G culture plaques. It's pretty much a similar status when you actually treat it with code. So this this is INA's uh, uh, control, which uh, you can see don't have a signal of uh, this kind of G culture plaques. So what do we see the signature here is actually INA specific. So based on that, we can confirm that a G code can enhance the G culture plaques folding in vivo. So again, because G culture plaques was known to suppress the translation, so we really want to know, okay, if the code have so many uh, strong folded, like enhanced G culture plaques folding, whether or not the translation will significantly change. But uh, interestingly, when we did a, a translation uh, efficiency, we found a four degree and a 22 degree don't have a strong enhancement after four degree treatment. Um, they are quite similar as uh, um, the, the 22 degree compare uh, between the 22 and the four degree. So we wonder whether or not actually these code induced G culture plaques had other molecular function. 
So we did a, a transcription arrest assay to measure the RNA uh, decay. So try to see how much the, these g quadruplex can affect the RNA stability. So very interestingly, if you just follow my line is 22 degree, you actually have a pretty much a strong uh, degradation, but a four degree generally all the RNA is tended to be more kind of stable. Shockingly is uh, the three UTR uh, g code induced RG4 have a biggest actually stabilized uh, effect than the uh, other part of uh, g quadruplex also non-RG4 RNA. So you, you kind of can see is under four degree, uh, these uh, code induced RG4, especially in the three UTR can stable RNA uh, strongly. So this is a one individual example. You can see these uh, uh, messenger RNA, which contain g quadruplex in their three UTR, have a much more stable, uh, less uh, slow RNA decay rate. But uh, actually, 22 degree, you have a fast decay. But uh, once you put it into four degree, g quadruplex formation uh, formed, then actually it can stabilize uh, your messenger RNA. So again, we want to validate whether or not it's actually due to the g quadruplex causing these kind of uh, effect on the stabilization of, of uh, RNA. So what do we actually see is we actually did, did a report assay which fused the Y type g quadruplex on the three UTR and also mutated the g quadruplex G to A abortion their capability forming g quadruplex. Okay, again, if you follow the line is uh, in the uh, 22 degree, the Y type G quadruplex uh, de degradation faster. So once you put a four degree where G quadruplex forming, you can see at the starting slow the degradation getting more stable. Once, once you actually mutated this G quadruplex, again, 22 degree, still similar kind of decay rate, but once four degree, you cannot form G quadruplex any longer, the degradation is kind of significantly faster than the G quadruplex one. So this is a report assay. Again, we want to go back to see how much it can influence the plant growth. So we took a, 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 this genes mu, uh, mutant lines called a SAC1 demonstration g quadruplex function. So we take a, this uh, non-mutant and uh, complement uh, the whole gene with three UTR Y type g quadruplex complement uh, into this non-mutant and also mutated the g quadruplex into this non-mutant. Again, 22 degree. Um, this is Columbia Y type. This is non mutant. This is a Y type uh, complementarity of G quadruplex. This is mutated G quadruplex complementarity because this GQS only folded uh, uh, in the code response. So you don't see any phenotype difference on the 22 degree growth. But uh, when you actually treat uh, the four degree uh, treatment, uh, put a plant into four degree, what you can see, Columbia, you, when you put it into code, it will have a shorter root. When you actually put a non-mutant there, it's insensitive to the code, so it's have a longer route. So then when you actually using the complement G quadruplex Y type one complement uh, the mutant, you will see after the code treatment, it was similar response as Columbia, which the root getting shorter. But if you complement with mutated G quadruplex, the whole plant is actually more similar to the non-mutant, where actually RNA degradation actually uh, getting faster. So then, uh, because we actually find a very interesting phenomenon of a code response, so we take advantage of a, a, a thousand plant transcriptome, try to see whether or not a G quadruplex is kind of a selected a, a molecular marker crossing the plant kingdom, which actually um, kind of associated to their uh, habitat. So what do we do is we took uh, all the, um, 1000 transcriptome and uh, correspondingly, we take uh, all their actually temperature measurement. This is one example of annual mean temperature of the species. So this is uh, how frequency of G quadruplex identity, uh, uh, density. So which you can see is if uh, the temperature is lower, you have a uh, more G quadruplex uh, uh, um, density crossing their transcriptome. Compared to these hot one, you actually have a low kind of a G quadruplex density. So when we do these 1000 transcriptome, 
um, doing their G quadruplex uh, kind of uh, motif density uh, association with their temperature. What are we using is uh, uh, all the kind of uh, temperature parameter. We can find that actually there's a significantly anti-correlation with uh, all these plant species. So which means really is uh, these plant species growing in the more cooler, colder temperature tend to enrich on their whole transcriptome more uh, RG4 sequence, G quadruplex sequence. But uh, rather the, the perception, which means the, the, the wetness, the, the, the raining uh, status don't have a really strong significant like, kind of a consistent uh, a relationship with uh, the G quadruplex uh, density. So from that perspective, we kind of uh, hypothesis uh, this uh, G quadruplex can be using as a kind of a temperature sensor as a, a selection marker to adapt, uh, help the plant to adapt to different kind of uh, um, habitat. So, uh, so just to summarize this part, so we think a plant adopt RNA G quadruplex as a possible code sensor, try to actually uh, stabilize their RNA, try to protect the plant uh, survive in the uh, cold stress uh, condition. So now we can update a little bit more on the translation. Uh, also stability is uh, somehow G quadruplex can kind of help uh, uh, suppress translation in the normal temperature, but uh, in a cold response, G quadruplex in the 3 UTR can actually stabilize the RNA. So we kind of have a little bit of update, still a lot of work needed to be done. So I just want to acknowledge my group. So we try to form a, a STEM loop here, uh, all my group member. So all the funding agents, oh, it has been quite difficult during coronavirus, but we still try to keep up, uh, try to understand more about the, the structure functionality inside of the plant system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ilang. So if you guys have questions, can you guys please um, type it in the Q&A or uh, type it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, so we have a talk, uh, we have a question from Ram. So he says, a fascinating talk was wondering how evolutionarily conserved is this feature of having single strand dinucleotides <laughs> Will proper splicing to occur. Also, are there diseases associated with mutations in these dinucleotides they may inhibit splicing? Yeah, uh, so from the uh, thousand plant transcriptome with, uh, so this flowering genes, which uh, we only get an individual one because uh, like uh, the AP2 plant uh, flower identity gene is actually strongly highly conserved across a uh, thousand plant uh, transcriptome. So we can see these dinucleotide starting have a certain sele selection. So we kind of validate that part, try to see how much actually this dinucleotide is divergent. Really interesting is this AP2 in certain plant species like a pepper, their flower is actually at the undercleaved. So in the Arabidopsis, diacot is actually uh, non-cleaved. So originally people, the protein is very similar domain, but the structure feature is actually different because there's a certain selection. So we try to explain and validate more towards crossing these uh, plant species diversity. So possibly as uh, some species select these two dinucleotide to undergo microRNA cleavage, some actually don't. So uh, it's very interesting towards actually how, how amazing this uh, uh, thousand plants can using uh, plant species using different me me mechanism to regulate the, their flowering development, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and from Shifeng, can adding, addition, adding structural information better predict whether a mutation snip around the exon intron junction will affect splicing? That's our first question. Yeah, um, so current stage is, uh, uh, it's a little bit uh, tricky because uh, you have to do a lot of actually kind of uh, st structure study, because if you just fold it without uh, the in vivo data, if you just fold it uh, in silico, this site will be base pair the dinucleotide single strand site will be base pair. So what do we have to do is current, what do we do is we're going through nature of viration where actually splicing didn't happen. So we detect their in vivo structure, try to see whether or not because this two nucleotide is become double stranded instead of single stranded causing that. So you just need to validate one by one instead of a current stage, you just predict it. So the, the, the in silico prediction won't gather you the, the, the right answer. So, but however, if you have in vivo 
data, of course, it's it's possible to know whether or not it's actually splice or not. Um, I guess the question is, so if let's say previously by prediction, right? Um, mm -hmm. There was, I think you said there was like 70% error. Uh, I can't, there's a certain amount of error rate. So now yeah. if we add in the structural information, how much more accurate do you think we'll be able to go? So uh, this is tricky. not a Python one. It's, a, it's the complementarity for the oh, micro Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's the micro right. one way is uh, if we're current stage is 70% of false positive. So if we're using the structure feature to predict the site, so we design artificial micro -RNA. So I only can say about the artificial micro -RNA. So the current stage is uh, if you don't using any structure information, the maximum you can get is uh, pretty much 70%, not over that. So if we're using that to actually predict uh, using structure information guided to actually uh, design the artificial micro -RNA, we can reach 95, 90 to 95% of uh, uh, micro -RNA cleavage efficiency. So it becomes kind of a really good tools to know. But however, we yeah. actually uh, get a more region to actually know better what's the rule behind it. So target site, how easy to unfold. Also the dinucleotide, it's become kind of more effective. So current stage is at least 10 different artificial micro -RNA design individual one, we actually can reach pretty much that percent. But uh, splicing prediction still something on the way. Okay, sounds great. And the second question is, can you use an exogenous RNA to base pair with splice side to block splicing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we can we can do these kind of things. So originally design is we don't want to disrupt the U1 uh, sequence. Uh, this will be actually uh, another thing we can try to test whether or not we can block it. So the only thing we don't want to affect the U1 coming on, coming down. So that's why we didn't using exogenous there. But the uh, current stage is we collaborated with uh, CryEM people try to see how this two nucleotide really try to help. But it's kind of difficult. We think it's still quite dynamic. I see, yeah, really interesting. Okay, the next question, um, very interesting result that code can induce more G quads, quadruplexes. Would you suggest that these code induced G quadruplexes are more likely due to low temperature induced thermodynamic changes um, in folding or because of enzymatic activity changes, for example, um, RNA binding proteins or G quadruplex assembly, yeah. I think uh, both should be actually all affected. So firstly, as a G-quadruplex uh, uh, is actually more slow kinetics, but uh, if you put a code they are uh, longer enough, or if we treat a long time, you can see it's the getting folded stronger and stronger. So if for two hours, three, four hours, you see more. Like, uh, uh, so this is what we think. So once it's getting stable, it's actually more stronger folded than just a stem loop. So stem loop kinetics is faster, but uh, the g quadruplex is relatively slow, but uh, they actually getting very stable. Um, so we did a lot of uh, biophysics analysis on individual coda response one. Uh, so you can really see coda can affect the folding status quite strongly. And uh, we also think uh, this is the reason why in the plant species where you grow and the room temperature 2020-ish 20, can actually detect uh, so many global g quadruplex but in the mouse, you couldn't see that. So this is pretty much a kind of a feeling as we think the, the temperature is actually a strong uh, driven factor for the g quadruplex formation. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I actually find it to be curious also because I was under the impression that the g quadruplexes are quite strong in their folding, right? So I'm yeah. surprised that in human cells, let's say between plants and human, even if you say, is 37 degrees that we see so much fewer G quadruplexes because of the temperature. So I did find that to be curious, yeah. Yeah, interestingly, I think uh, the Jun Jieguo, who actually published the original like, mouse paper on the G-quadruplex. So we recently submitted the paper back to back. So basically, they also find that in the human cell line, if they treat a cold stress or certain uh, osmolite stress, they can also induce G-quadruplex. So um, they think uh, it's actually quite a strong uh, feature of actually stress response. So maybe G-quadruplex is a kind of only kind of involved in the human system is actually a uh, response to stress instead of a plant is more normally using it. Um, interesting part is in a human, the whole 
G quadruplexes tend to be G3, G4, G5, so multiple layer, which is e quite a one set fold. It's harder to unwind, right? But in the plant, mostly is G2, G quadruplex. So it's relatively easy to dynamic shift. So we think uh, this is might be actually kind of a, a little bit of divergent towards evolution, towards uh, how they're using it differently. Do you know um, what are the proteins that regulate G quadruplexes? Like whether people have identified any RBPs that so are the state, Yeah, so current stage, there's a couple of uh, DDX36 is the one which is uh, the, the, the helicases, uh, which actually really specific uh, to the G-Cogiplex. But the uh, current stage is uh, several group is trying to identify different protein. We also try to get a plant specific uh, uh, RNA binding protein to that. But I think uh, there will be actually uh, quite a few helicases involved in the whole uh, winding process. I see, okay. So I have another question. So you show that the G quadruplexes in plants for the cold response right, mostly affect stability. So does the distribution um, occur more towards the three prime end? instead of the five prime N when they are regulating translation? Yeah, it's more close to the three prime end. So I didn't really talk detail, but uh, there's uh, some more primary things. So if the g quadruplex most code is actually uh, more in re code response for induced g quadruplex in the, in the three UTR, yes. also the, 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 the end close to the CDS, so the, the later half of the CDS, so the uh, close to the stop codon. So even there's a coding region way, it's also close to the stop codon. So we kind of can measure something like a no-go decay. Um, it's also influenced the stability. So we kind of feel is like a, they actually have a, a little bit of function towards a code induced these g quadruplex can control mostly as a stability pathway, uh, no matter whether or not they are in coding region or actually through UTR. I see. Okay, we have one last question. Um, is there any difference in shape map reactivity between constitutive splicing size and alternative splicing size in plants? Um, I, I think uh, we didn't uh, compare they, them together. We most actually just separate uh, two things and just to try to see the event. But, uh, I think uh, the constitutive splicing side should have a more higher shape reactivity than alternative splice side. But uh, if we, we, I can double check, but uh, it's pretty much likely to be. I see. Is there a lot of alternative splicing in plants as well? I actually not yeah, so familiar. It's pretty much more than 40, 40%. It's actually quite a strong. The difference is an interesting part is uh, the plant intron is relatively smaller than the human one. So that's why it might be actually different mechanism uh, from the, the human side, but uh, it's kind of the things we saw, yeah. I see. Well, thank you so much. So in the interest of time, um, we'll close the seminar and thank you. Thanks everyone for joining and thanks Ilan for the wonderful talk. Okay, thank thanks you. everyone, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, see you, see you soon Ilan, bye-bye. See you soon, bye. <laughs>